Good here, my name is Bill uh, Levin, and I'm on the faculty here, um, and also the lead scientist for the Nature Conservancy in Washington. And I have the true honor of introducing our speaker today, Mary Buckleshaus. I have a bunch of things I wrote down. Um, the main thing you need to know is when I grow up, I want to be Mary. Um, <laughs> that's true. It's been true, even though I think we're the same age, but mentally, I think she's 10 years or 20 years ahead of me, uh, or at least she matured. So uh, Mary started her career uh, getting a degree in human biology from Stanford, which is a liberal arts school, I think, in California, the Bay Area, if you don't know it. Um, it's a good school. Um, uh, she then uh, came here to University of Washington, where she got a master's degree in fisheries, then um, got a PhD in botany. So she's gone from human to fish to uh, plants, which I think is probably like higher in the evolutionary <laughs> scale each time. Um, then she got a job, which is always good, at Florida State. Uh, she lasted three years um, and moved to NOAA Fisheries um, in the late 90s, which is when we met when I also left academics and went to the government. So we've been interacting together since the Clinton administration. Um, while she was at NOAA, there was a couple of notable things. Is this too long? I don't know, whatever. Uh, there's a couple of notable things I'd say. One is um, she ran a, a I, I would say she ran, I don't know. Technically, she didn't run it, but let's just say she did. A thing called Shared Solutions, which is really about Puget Sound, um, salmon, conservation, um, which is an amazing thing. And the products of that led to, and the sort of the model that led to the Puget Sound Partnership, which is this really unique and continuing private-public partnership that centers around um, managing the uh, Puget Sound ecosystem, and that continues today, and she would, eventually was the chief scientist for that. Then um, she quit NOAA um, and moved to the Natural Capital Project, where she's now the managing director, and she is also called a consulting professor at Stanford, which sounds very important. I have no idea what it is. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear about the Natural Capital Project, but for those of you who don't know, just a brief like one sentence thing is it's a really cool partnership between NGOs and universities where they're bringing the best and sort of cutting edge science around ecosystem services to bear in real situations and really transforming what's happening around. And Mary's work has been uh, international in scope and transformative in lots of different settings. So it's super exciting to have her here. And um, yeah, so take it away. Eight weeks, 
we, we basically rebuilt the Pacific Crest Trail in certain places where the Forest Service told us to. And I learned three really sort of fundamental things in those two summers that have stayed with me my whole life for my career and what I do for fun. And one is that public lands really are a public good and they're a trust that we have to take care of. So we were redoing the PCT way before there were all the boards of people that are on it these days. Um, and it was a lot of work and you're not allowed to use chainsaws in wilderness areas. So I learned a lot about the importance of, of ongoing stewardship of public lands and how important that is. I also learned how much being out in nature helped me physically and mentally. And I didn't, hadn't really thought of that before so explicitly, but it really, it really was um, transformative. And then the third thing is this idea of this incredible diversity of people on our crew. So we had 10 high schoolers and then a couple of older, you know, older college kids who were the kind of counselors. But they were from all over the Northwest, but most of them from lower socioeconomic backgrounds than I was and very racially diverse. And by the halfway through our time each summer, we all had so much more in common than we thought we did and we ended up all realizing how much we loved being out in nature. So that idea that really different background people can come together and find common purpose in being in the environment also really stuck with me. So it was a, a great thing and I'm very sad that it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so the only other bit of context I wanted to, to remind us all and just get you thinking about is how your science, my science is very personal and we bring our own personal biases and perspectives to it which can make it creative but we also have to be aware of that. But it's also really personal I've found is that how you do your science with whom and for what end is also a personal choice and you can change throughout your science career as Phil said I started in academia, thought I was doing relevant science, and then I came to know and realized, oh, there's a lot more to it to be relevant for decisions. And now I'm at NatCap where we, we do a lot of the work sort of more like a uh, hybrid between academia and government science. So there's not one way to do it, and you can change along the way, I guess is my main context for this. OK, so diving in. I'm going to give a, a story, three storylines today about how the Natural Capital Project is doing science to change how people take the values of the environment into their decisions. And I'm going to give you three really different examples. But it's, we're at a really exciting time for those of you guys who don't know this field of sort of environmental economics. And there was in the, the 90s, uh, this is Ken Arrow from Stanford who just passed away. He was one of the first people and the Stockholm Resilience Center did a lot of this work. They really laid out the theoretical foundations of how might you value what ecosystems bring to people. Some of it monetary, some of it not in terms of the theory. And then starting in about the 90s, the mid 90s, there started to be a slow growth of the first set of real um, cases of showing how this could work and how you can apply that theory on the ground. And one of the most famous stories is the Catskills watershed, which supplies the water for New York City. And it's a big watershed for those of you guys who don't know it. And the idea that people came up with was maybe uh, as New York was considering putting in a water treatment plant, to provide clean water for more growing population. Maybe instead they should try to see what would it cost to take advantage of all of the green infrastructure in the Catskills watershed, all the forest, all the agricultural lands, all the green that was there, because people knew it filtered water very effectively. So they costed it using some of this theory, and the cost was about um, one-sixth of what it would cost to put in a water treatment plant if you instead invested in changing agriculture practices, putting in buffers around streams, protecting parts of forests in the Catskills, letting people live there and work there, but investing in the green infrastructure instead. So that kind of case started building and growing. It's, it's a famous one. It's been written up a lot. It's now spread around the world. 
The Nature Conservancy has done probably 60 of these throughout Latin America and Africa. They call them water funds. But that idea of testing it in one place, like New York City, they're still doing it today, and seeing what the benefits are from clean water has really, really been a, a change for how people apply these. So then that cap, which is what we call ourselves, we founded in 2006. And at that point, so it was about a decade after this handful of examples existed, we decided, OK, you know what? I th we think it's time that we could start systematizing, building a common language and a common approach to trying to bring this kind of ecosystem value into decision. So that's really our mission. And we do it with Phil said, like Phil said, with a lot of people, a lot of partners, including you, Doug. So for those of you guys, you probably know this, that, you know, these are e different ways of talking about ecosystem services or benefits from nature. Most of us in this room have really good intuitive feels about the benefits nature brings to us. But if you think about helping decision makers, a policy maker or a finance person, you need to put this in metrics that they can use. That's really different than your intuitive sense. So this is what we do. We build process models that are rigorous descriptions of the ecosystem, how it functions, what its structure is, how it provides flows of benefits to people and a host of different endpoints that they can then use in their decisions. And I just wanted to, as putting this in context of where we are today, there's this lovely paper by Georgina Mace, if you guys haven't seen this, where she sort of goes through, mostly focusing on the right-hand column there, how the science underpinning trying to influence conservation practice or investments has really changed partly because of the science has evolved, but also partly because people's ideas about people and nature have changed a lot. So it started out with people, nature for itself, and then nature despite people, nature for people, and now we're really in this kind of more dialectic view of the world where nature and people intersect and intertwine. And there, we do bad things to nature, we also do good things to nature, and nature does a lot of good things for us, and sometimes it does, it harms us depending on how well we are um, interacting with it. So this is, I, I find, very helpful, and when we do our interactions, and probably you two out in the world, you will run into people who sort of came of age in all of these stages, so it helps you think about, okay, where are they coming from, what are they bringing to the discussion about how ecosystems can benefit them or not. And if we had a final row on that table, that's about a six-year-old paper now, there'd be a new idea here, which the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, it's, that's a mouthful, but it's kind of the IPCC for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, they have spent years working out a new framing of nature and people, really that, that dialectic that Georgina Mace was talking about. And they are really advocating that we call it nature's contributions to people. But it's a, the language you can quibble with. We could argue over that for a really long time. What I really like about this new framework they have is in the global assessment that they just completed, they, they signed it into um, approval by all the countries that are members back in May. We did a big modeling as part of it. They have all sorts of knowledge and information in it that's beyond remote sensing or transects or the kind of conventional information that we all are used to in our in our ecology or in our science. So they're really emphasizing multiple ways of knowing and multiple sources of knowledge as you think about these this kind of work. So it's an exciting time, really, really intersecting a lot of different disciplines. Okay, so down to the three examples I'll give you. We've been, in our, in our 12 years or so of being a partnership, we've been working to prove out cases, sort of doing more cat skills, if you think of it that way, more examples in really diverse settings with really diverse decision makers. What kind of information do they need to incorporate values of nature? What metrics, what scales, what kind of modeling can we help them? So I'm going to talk to you about three of these. Um, and the first one is on mangrove forests and development planning in the Caribbean. 
The next one is on work we're doing in China, which is moving incredibly fast with policy and finance and testing it really rigorously. And then the final one is a brand new um, project that we're working on with the World Bank, trying to move quickly to influence all countries in the world that are members of the World Bank rather than doing one dot at a time on a map, which is kind of frustrating and slow paced. Okay, so the first example is with the Malaysian government. So this is um, Chantal Clark Samuels, who when we started was a minister um, in one, one part of the environment ministry, and then she became what they call the CEO of this overarching coastal zone um, authority. And this is Katie Arkema, who also sits right around the corner. She's a NACAP lead scientist who's a really good coastal ecologist and knows mangroves and coral reefs. So the Malaysian government invited NACAP in to help them incorporate nature's values into their coastal development plan for the whole country. And what we first did in this engagement is to say, okay, let's reduce that problem down to something that's manageable. So we focused on three focal habitats, mangroves, coral reefs, and seagrasses. And then out of all the many benefits that they could have chosen to try to describe for their goals, the Malaysians chose protection from storms because they get a lot of hurricanes there, lobster fishery benefits, and tourism. So those are lobster fisheries and tourism are their two biggest economic drivers. And the storms are really also um, affecting them greatly. Okay, so I have a few slides here that overlap just to show and I'm not going to really spend any time on this, but it's a really fun and fascinating part of our work. We, we work in what we call co-development ways, so we really talk to the decision makers from the very beginning of the project and do this in a very iterative way so that we understand what they care about and what they want. And then we, as we are going along, learn from them about their systems and how they know it from data and traditional knowledge, but also um, train them in how to do these, these models. So we start with games. This is a board game that we use. Then they bring in their local data. We use a lot of global data, remotely sensed data. And then we look at maps, and many times we're out in these community keys in Belize in this case. And we have maps with our data on them, and they'll look at it and say, oh, I know there's some better information here. We have actual data on notebooks, or you can go talk to this elder over here. So there's a lot of iteration in bringing in diverse sources of information, which helps them trust the modeling that we're then going to do. So the two main questions that we asked in this study were, how do these coastal habitats change the flows of ecosystem benefits to people? That seems, it's a really important one. It's pretty basic in framing, but it was not basic to answer. And then how do changes that they're proposing in their development plan and human activities change these, these ecosystem service flows? And where are the people affected by that? Where do they benefit, where do they lose? So I'm not gonna go through every single analysis we did because it's a lot, but one, one of the examples of new science, so often when people think about, oh, you're working with decision makers, you're just kind of, regurgitating science that's already available. In, in all of NatCap's work, we purposefully choose cases where they, that it hasn't been proven out, the science isn't proven, and neither is the outcome. So this was one example of new science that Katie and a bunch of us led, adopting a habitat risk assessment approach from fisheries, actually, and generalizing it to all sorts of activities. There's a, some of you in here know this better than I do, there's a really tough step of going from human activities and scenarios, if you want to think of them, to saying what are the effects on natural features like habitats, and often people just do it in sort of a best, best practices or first principles sort of way, but Katie developed and her team developed a way to do this in a quantitative and spatial way. So you take alternative future activities that the Belizeans in these community groups said they were, were interested in. We can move them around spatially. And then quantify what are the risks to these focal habitats 
and then those habitat maps go into these ecosystem service models. In this case, I'm just showing one of them, which is a tourism valley. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is the schematic of the model for the habitat risk. It has a lot of descriptions of both what are the consequences of the risk that have to do with these sorts of factors, and then what are the things that affect the exposure of a particular piece of mangrove or coral reef to that risk. So this is basically the translation model between human activities like dredging or coastal agriculture or aquaculture or fishing and how that affects habitat. So it's just kind of step one on that framework. And I just want to point out this little um, logo down here. This is our software that's open source. It's called InVest. It has about two dozen of these models in it now. So what we do in each case that we develop new science, we, we put it in an open source software tool that's coded in Python, for those of you guys who know Python. And then that becomes not only what we use in that location, but then other people, it's on our website, other people download it and use it all over the world. So we end up with this kind of crowdsourced scientific community that's testing it and helping us to refine the model. So since that habitat risk model was published in 2014, it's been now almost, I think it's over 30 pages published that are applying and testing it, so it's always refining and becoming better. And one of them was done right here in Josh Lawler's lab, a postdoc that we shared in JW, and she tested it down at Fort Lewis. So it was, the model was developed in Belize, but it's generalizable, and so we were curious how well it would do down there, and it did really well. So it's just an example of how we're trying to get these innovations out faster. So another new science question that came up in the Belize case was, was around tourism. And essentially, if you change a mangrove forest or coral reef, how does that change the value of tourists coming to Belize? And this was also something that was not able, we were not able to do uh, before. And Spencer Wood, who's here, actually at UW, he was a gnat capper, um, he developed this approach. This is essentially the economic model that you want to try to develop when you're looking at visitation. You want to look at what causes people to decide to go to particular places and how many people go. And that's going to be a function of some of the, what is the environment like, but also some of the built environment. Is there access or nice places to stay? So you want to get from your visitation rate, this, a suite of factors. We were interested in how did the natural factors, features, of, affect visitation rate. And since there were no counts, you know, you know, when you go to a national park or some many places, there's a there's a counter. And actually, Spencer and his team, who are right here in the front row, are figuring out really interesting ways to validate this so, sort of social media approach that he pioneered back when we were starting in Belize and you know, the early, earlier this decade. Um, but it's really hard if you can't count people. So his idea was to use social media. He used Flickr initially. Now they're using all sorts of social media data to look at how well can geotag photos indicate how many people go to a certain place. And then how can that be validated it with areas where we had both Flickr data and counts, like these national parks, and found a pretty good relationship. They've refined it quite a bit now, and Sam and Emmy are right here, and would love to talk to you more about that. I can say that. So once you get that visitation rate from the social media data, you then want to look at how can you really quantify it and make it a function of both habitats and human activities. So this is the, the general schematic that he used to, to estimate that. Very just simple, but very data-rich statistical models. And he worked out a really good um, scheme that was then published. And now this, out of all, this is also in one of the INVEST models. This model is used more than any of, any of the INVEST models we have out of the two dozen, because people can use it anywhere. And it just keeps getting better, because there's more different more sources of data and more ways to, to validate and relate to um, what you can see. So this became part of the development plan. This estimates 
We had both the number of people, and this shows another metric of value, which is the expenditure. So not only how many people go to a certain place, but what did they spend? And how does that vary? The model allows you to have it as a function of the status of mangroves, the status of coral reefs. You can then get an estimate of how many people and how the expenditures will vary as the, the ecosystem health and condition change. So the Belize synthesis then, I didn't talk about these other two models. There was a new lobster fishery model and also coastal protection. So how much do mangroves and coral reefs help protect from flooding and erosion and the storms? But it was a similar process of so brand new models that didn't exist before. Neither, neither lobster fishery nor coastal protection had, we didn't have ways to say what about these habitats in their spatial arrangement would affect the landings and value of lobster of fisheries or flooding. And the, the interesting thing just to see here is that if you do a spatial analysis like this, these show the different habitat types of mangroves are in gray and corals are orange, but also the, the, the services, the benefits, lobsters paint, tourism is green, and coastal protection is blue is how much spatial heterogeneity there is on the condition of the habitats currently and under these different scenarios, and then therefore on the outcomes. And one interesting thing about working with the people who are going to use your results, they all wanted not, they wanted, they wanted in Malaysian dollars as one metric of value, so avoided damages, expenditures of tourists, and revenue from fishery landings, but they also wanted biophysical metrics because the decisions they were considering for how much land was going to be eroded or not flooded under coastal protection, how many visitors would you get under these different scenarios and places, and then how many pounds of lobster would be caught. They wanted both of those value metrics. And we had been noticing, and this happens in all of our projects, there's a big fight in the academic literature about should you put a dollar value on nature or should you not? And if you go out and just ask the people who want to incorporate the value of nature in their decisions, they'll tell you. Some people want it monetized, some people don't, some people want both. Um, so it really kind of takes it out of the, the argument in a vacuum and just says, okay, what's going to move the policy or what's going to move the finance? So this became part of the official Belizean plan. It's now, um, I think I have a slide, yeah. So this is now an integrated development plan. They, they made a new ministry in Belize that, that combines a whole bunch of ministries on the coast so they can manage it together with those three objectives in mind. It has a big loan from the Inter-American Development Bank, so it's actually being implemented. There's a lot of new science and tools. I showed you a little bit of that. And then there's been a lot of total capacity. So John Tall is now the head of the whole agency that oversees this plan. And we're still working with them to measure the impacts of, to see if our models actually are being borne out and in practice as they put in some of these restoration and, and they've been hit by about three hurricanes since we finished the plan. So now scaling this research impact, the, 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 this recreation modeling has taken off, as I mentioned. So um, Sergei is in the her, just look at that picture, you look so <laughs> So Sergei and Spencer shared a student, um, Harry, who looked at this approach when it was very early to look at visitation in national parks and tested it. That turned out to be a really good part of the thesis. And then Josh Lawler and Greg Bratman here and Seth are using a lot of these same methods and adapting them just sort of inspired by the original work, but especially looking at visitor experience, so mood and um, other mental health aspects of urban spaces and peri-urban spaces, so really pushing the frontiers of the science there. And Spencer and team are really trying to harness this incredible diversity of social media data um, and information that you can get from tweets and people's words and tweets and applying it all over the Pacific Northwest and, and the U.S. and actually the world, because some of us doing some of this in the Belize and the Belize American League too. So there's a lot that came out of that initial little Belize case that's now exploding the science in really interesting and creative ways. 
And then finally, this is my last slide about this case. Um, the mangrove systems themselves, so in that development planning science that we did, we found we were able to quantify their value for avoiding flood damage, but also the tourism values in heart and sword and sea restoration. And now this is leading to, with the Inter-American Development Bank, a really big interest in harnessing the climate finance that's coming out of the Paris um, Climate Accord, where these countries in the north are making commitments to make investments to climate abatement in areas like the Caribbean, and mangroves are top of their list for the forest kind of investments they want to make. So they're starting to use our models and other approaches to drive climate finance into those high priority areas that the planning has identified. And then the second one is to try to get beyond like, okay, we did Belize, let's do Bahamas, let's do Guatemala, let's do the next one, is to build a toolkit where using remote sensing data, and Allison and others are working on this, um, who's in here, um, to try to make this more easily replicable for more people um, throughout the region. And I, I put these uh, women up here. They just happen to be women. They're, they're, we have lots of male leaders here. But this is how this happens, is by relationships with people in the region. So we worked with Chantal in Belize. She's here. And as we were doing this work, we met through some regional conferences on climate resilience. These two women from the Inter-American Development Bank, Michelle LeMay, Cassandra Barnes, and they said, oh, hey, this is great. We have to do this everywhere, but how can we do it faster? So they both got loans for the, from the IDB to Belize to make sure that the plan could start getting implemented. And they also connected us with, this is uh, Vir, uh, Nicola Virgil Roll from the Office of the Prime Minister in the Bahamas, who's the chair of the whole Latin American Caribbean region for IDB. So that has helped us, just those relationships and connections, start developing this toolkit so that 26 countries can do it instead of one at a time. So I just wanted to emphasize how important the people that you need in your work can really make you um, make a difference on the scale of your science much faster. Okay, that was the first example, and so by far the longest. These next two are much shorter. Okay, I'll talk now about China, so really different. So China, as you probably know, had huge flooding and, and disasters in the mid-80s. They still have bad air quality in Beijing, but also the panda population decline really peaked in the mid-80s. And this got the attention of the central government. So in 2013, they declared that the next century for China would be to build an ecological civilization. They're, they're good at metaphors, as you probably have gathered. So over that the 10 year period from the early 2000s till now, they spent over 150 billion US dollars in ecosystem restoration. And now that's about to double. So what we've been working on with them, the Chinese Academy of Sciences is a partner of NACAC, is these basic science questions. Where and how much should this country protect ecosystems to secure people and livelihoods? Um, and then how can they move beyond GDP as an indicator? So I'm just going to run through this. So what we've done with them, and they're, uh, those of you who've worked in China, you know this, they move incredibly fast, and they're very collaborative scientifically. So what we typically do with them is develop the modeling approaches, and then they run them, and practically before our plane lands back on the West Coast, they've already done them. But what we did first was use, we adapted some of our invest models and made new ones to help them map and model their country for where is the food production, just to get an idea of where are these natural capital assets in the country and where are they flowing to people. Here's water supply. I'm not going to go through all of them. You can see some are idiosyncratically Chinese, like sandstorm prevention. This is really from the Gobi and the overgrazing there is causing terrible sandstorms down in Beijing and other regions. regions. They also have flood mitigation, soil retention, carbon storage, and sequestration, et cetera. From these analyses, they set up a whole set of ecosystem accounts and a monitoring system that they're monitoring now um, monthly, and they do annual 
assessments of all of their services and all their change in net or profit costs. It's just astounding how quickly they set all that up. We have integrated data sets. We're, we're green with jealousy. <laughs> they also have started implementing policies. So they have a national zoning plan. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. And as a result of this paper published in 2016, it showed that over a 10-year period of many investments in what they call their green to green program and their sloping land conversion program, these are payment schemes to change practices and where people live to reduce um, problem ecosystem service flows like flooding. They, everything was improving over that 10 year period because of those, those harness policies, except for biodiversity. Biodiversity was declining. So they started a national park system to address this. So they've done the hotspot analysis and they're putting national parks in place. Here's the zoning that I mentioned. These are zones, uh, it's now almost 50% of the, the land area of China are zoned explicitly to provide these ecosystem service benefits. So all the decisions that are made about land use are focused on those outcomes that they measure. I'm gonna skip that. And then their finance response, just in the last five years now, they've been paying people to restore natural capital in some of those zones where it's below what they, what they wanted it to be. They're developing urban models with us. It's, um, it's just kind of staggering how quickly they're moving and they're very collaborative and they would love help from anybody in here on any of this work. I should have said that at the beginning. And so the last part of this I'll, I'll tell you about, just because it links to the World Bank work we're doing too, is that they're, in China they're really big on measuring. They have more, you know, sort of sensors, you've heard this, the good and the bad of the sensors and the monitoring um, culture that they have. But it's also incredibly useful data for keeping track of things. So what they decided in 2014 is that they wanted an alternative metric at the national scale, but that also could be scaled down to municipalities, so provinces and municipalities, called Gross Ecosystem Product, GEP, and said that would go alongside GDP, and it's defined as here, the total value of goods and services that's supplied annually. So we've been working with them to design how to calculate, how to define and calculate GEP, and again, they've just taken off and but here's the construct. So GDP is mostly, you know, the sort of built environment, manufacturing, and these flows from the economic system. There are some natural-based factors in GDP because there's a market for them. So in sports, food, tourism, agriculture. But there's a lot of things, as we know, that are benefits to an economy that are not in markets. And how to capture those is what GDP does. So there's just a handful of them there as examples, but those factors are now being monetized in China and there's, they're calculating GDP for the nation. They've done it for three years in a row now with these accounts that they set up and they're now using it to um, pilot in about five counties and ten cities in China. So here's how it's set up. They have lots of their own satellites, they use ESA and NASA ones as well. They have a lot of ecological monitoring they do themselves and field surveys. So all of their data are integrated for the purpose of calculating the accounts in GDP. They use INVEST for some of the, the factors for the flows, not all of them. And then it, it has these outcomes. So GDP is already being used in pilots to evaluate the performance of leaders. So they used to always get evaluated and the mayors get ranked based on GDP. And that's how much money your city gets. Now they're being ranked on both GEP and GDP, so it will adjust how much money their city gets. Because as you all know, many GDP growth cases are at the expense of and undermining the natural capital stocks, and that's what we're trying to keep track of. They're also using it a lot for compensation among regions. So the western part of China, Qinghai province and others, they call it the water tower of Asia. 
all of that water supply goes to eastern China or northern where Beijing is. And they're using this GEP measure as a way to, to calibrate what those payments should be from east to west. Um, and because of that relation and value that they provide. So it's pretty, it's pretty astounding what they're doing and how quickly they're doing. They're going to measure, so they'll learn a lot. It's going to be a quickly adapting uh, and moving target. The first paper's out on I'd be happy to share it with anybody. OK, last example, which is even shorter because we're just starting. And that's to take this idea, sort of like GDP, a national indicator of how are your natural capital stocks and ecosystem service benefits doing. Um, and working with the World Bank to develop what's called a natural capital index for all of their countries. So some of you might have heard of the human capital index that the Jim Kim, the previous president of the bank, developed. This is meant to be a complement to that. That human capital index is only four years old. So this is really a lot like GEP, but you know, some countries don't want to take what China's doing and adapt it, so we're working with the bank to generalize it again so that it can be applied anywhere. But it's really focused on efficiency and measures the contribution of natural capital to these things that countries care about, economic and social dimensions of well-being. And it'll be used for policy evaluation. Okay, so this is how the bank intends to use it. Um, and this is going to be launched, I should say, we've been developing this since January this year. It'll be launched in June of this 2020. So it's sort of part way through development. We've been vetting it um, with a lot of different people. So here's the crux of the approach. And some of many of this room who know uh, this is either called a production possibility frontier or an efficiency frontier. It's an economic term. This is by Steve Pulaski and a whole bunch of colleagues. It's not new. This was published in 2008, the way he formulated it. But the idea is if, you're, if your current land use, that's what these maps are. This is the Willamette Basin, for those of you guys who might have recognized it, so close to home. Many countries, if you can think of this as a country or a region like the Willamette, are not, they're suboptimal. So their current land use isn't optimized. That's not surprising because nobody went and did an optimization model. So this is how you should develop. So the question is, how can you get to a more efficient place in terms of managing your lands and water so that your objectives, in this case, we're only showing two objectives. How much total economic benefit is coming off of this collection of land uses? And it's listed over here. It's, it's timber, agriculture, and housing development. And then in this case, on the y-axis, we have biodiversity. It's just a very different measure. In our NCI formulation, we have lots of different axes. But the idea is just to say there's many ways for a country to become more efficient and that's represented by those different land use configurations. So even if you don't want to be 100% biodiversity focused, you could still get a lot of biodiversity benefit and a lot more economic value out of your land use if you configure it in different ways or maybe manage it in different ways. So that's the, that's the construct that we're using to calculate this. And, we've, and the, there's lots of different ways to calculate the index itself. It's typically some version of distance to the frontier. So you can do an area, you can do the shortest distance. There's lots of different ways to calculate that. Well, we've calculated this now for 50 countries around the world with different scenarios. We're going to do it for 150 by December, so it's, it's moving fast. And then the, the really interesting part is which particular values are we able to put in right now? And each of these were hard and they could be so much better. So we would love collaboration on any of this. Right now what we have are these four values that we can monetize in a way that's not embarrassing. <laughs> Using global data, so you have to do this for every country. So these, these benefits are now monetized for any combination of those land uses in a country. And this set of them are not monetized because of course the bank is focused on human development, so they really care about health. So how is human health affected by different changes in ecosystem benefits and also 
biodiversity itself, we didn't want to put a dollar value on. So we're definitely using a dashboard sort of analogy to report on this. So the, the dashboard will look something like this um, for each country. There will be one index, and they will start ranking countries and use it as a benchmarking tool. But they'll also have a host of the, all the data underneath it so countries can look at how might I think about becoming more efficient with my natural resources. OK, so I'm about done. So that, those, are, those are three examples. And as I mentioned at the beginning, where you saw that map with all those little pins on it, we're trying in each of these cases to more quickly get these ideas out there and just help them spread. Because as you know, when you do research in one place, it takes a while, it takes a long time to build relationships. It's way better if this gets into more people's hands who already have those local knowledge and relationships. So one way we're doing that is through that invest platform I mentioned, and it's um, all open source, and we'd love more help on improving those or making new models. We do a lot of uh, networks convening and just getting leaders from different countries to share what they're doing that they're excited about, what they're really frustrated about, and where they need help. There's a lot of China training with other countries. Countries, as you can imagine, are suspicious of them, but they're also really curious to hear what they're doing, and it's very, they can be very open and collaborative when they're not, um, we're in the, in the right environment, I guess I would say. So we do a lot of network um, convening. And then the last thing I'll say is that this network of scientists and our um, kind of community is, you know, we have 350 different institutions on our website, it's much more than that. That's, that's all being shared through the way we all communicate. You go to meetings, you write papers, you maybe contribute to the software, there's lots of forums. There's a great cluster here at Kuga that we'd love to grow. But we're also starting to focus more on what are those really most promising scaling avenues? What are the institutions that can really sort of really emerge and make a difference and help spread these faster? So we're focusing a lot on government work. That's, of course, President uh, Xi. And then this is the president of Costa Rica. We're working with him because they have committed to a carbon neutral economy, as you might have known. And then the financial standards, that's Marianne Fay on the far right, she's a World Bank lead economist who's leading on that in the next. And then Bloomberg, the Bloomberg terminal is starting to take in our data and models. So if the finance community can start using this in, in thoughtful ways, that would be great. So we're trying to just, this is new for us, so we're trying to focus on what are these particular institutions that we think can make the biggest difference and keep all the science going in. We know how to do the roots part of this diagram. It's the, the tree trunks that we do. So I will stop there, but I, I did want to emphasize, if you can't read this, it says, something goes around something, but that's about as far as I've got. <laughs> that, that's kind of where we are right now in this field. I mean, we are, there's an incredible explosion of demand for information about what do ecosystems bring to people in terms of benefits. But how to do that science is in its infancy, and it would be really fun to collaborate with more of you to get you connected to our network. And, um, and then just thinking about the, the many different ways that ecosystem value comes to people, I think we're also just, just scratching the surface on that, too. So thank you for listening. And, and take I have a question about, um, I guess we might call it leakage. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go through these projects, one thing that could obviously happen is it could provide a best case example, and that could spread somewhere and increase the good. But the other possibility is it could be displacing activity to somewhere else where the good is, is fine where you were working, but there's more damage somewhere else. And yeah. I'm sure you guys have thought about this. But yeah, that's a big deal. So do you guys know this concept of leakage? It's exactly what you're saying. It's like you displace, like maybe you say, oh, I'm going to improve the protected areas here because there's so much, many benefits. I'm going to keep agriculture expansion out. But then that agriculture expansion just goes somewhere else, and it could actually be worse overall. It's, 
of leakage. It's these externalities that you don't account for in a particular place. There, um, it, and it, it is hard if you're just doing analysis in one place. We always have external drivers or external factors in the models that try to account for that. But there, it's very ish. So there's a new effort, and I know um, that, Dan, you know about this, this GTAP global modeling. Um, I forget what GTAP stands for, but it's global, global trade and agricultural. Oh, trade and agriculture, that's right. So that is a big global model that tries to really account for all these flows. So it, it's, a, it's a helpful, actually quantitative way to, to try to account for leakage, say, if you displace activity where would it actually get taken up and where would those benefits be displaced? And, and Citra 4 contributes the forest product sector to GTAP, our group at that Oh, starts. okay. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so then that, that GTAP group, it's led by Tom Hurdle at Purdue, yeah. but I know it is a big network, yeah. um, is now connecting to these, these invest models because we've done global runs now. So we're, we're just beginning to start to really quantify those leakage effects and I've been talking to Dan and Eric Broken and more of that too because that's, you're right, it's critical. You can fix your own little place of paradise but you might make it really worse somewhere else, yeah. Yeah. Um, great talk. Thank you. Have you, uh, in all the work that you've been doing around the world, have you encountered situations where you go in and you quantify some of the ecosystem services, and then it so happens that quantitatively it's actually better to not invest in the services. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. what do you do? Yeah, great question. So did you guys hear that? So have we ever gone someplace in where they say, oh, we want to we want to incorporate nature into our practices, so quantify nature versus something else for us, and then the answer is actually nature is worse. It's definitely happened to us. And it was a great lesson. So we worked on this project. I'll just give one example. It just happened in the Amazon in one project, but this, my favorite one is the Nature Conservancy had a big project with Dow Chemical to show how does, how does nature benefit their practices. So we did a project with them down in Freeport, Texas, where they were worried about, that's their biggest physical plant in the world. And there, you know, there's hurricanes, there's sea level rise, and they have a huge extensive marsh system in front of their physical plant. They were worried about flooding they had some little levees that were hard gray, gray infrastructure. So they said, quantify the value of this marsh to protect our physical plant, and then we can go make it happen. And the marsh could not protect from future sea level rise projections. That's that plant as well as cost effectively as a higher levee would. So we had to have a discussion among our team about, okay, the very first case that TNC worked on with Dow Chemical, the answer is nature doesn't pencil out. So we had to, we, we, you know, some people had a hard time <laughs> getting that message out, but everybody came together and that was the message. The great thing is right away there were three other projects where nature had a huge benefit that Dow could start taking up and uh, so people felt better about it, but it's, it's a great, like for a scientist, that's what you do. You give the results, and that's what it is. But if you're, if you're, if you're a little bit more like TNC in this case, was was hoping to showcase with Dow how nature could really benefit their operations. It was a bummer that the first story was not a positive one, but it worked out because now they have lots of good stories for water quality and other things. But it's good to remember that it's not going to be. You can't just say nature will help you everywhere all the time. You have to quantify it. Yeah. Yes. So you were saying one of the strengths of your building your products was that you really work with the stakeholders to find out what they want. Yeah. Um, and that that helped make the most useful product as possible. Um, so it seems like staying local was kind of a big part of that. But then with the World Bank project, how do you connect with the stakeholders of such a yeah, that is a, that we're just working through that with them. So yeah, it's a really good question, and, and I think the answer is, um, and this is why we're excited to work with the bank. They have country program leads who have deep relationships in the countries, and then they have country leaders who know the bank and the, and the program officers really well. So those are the people who will be communicating back and forth 
telling one another, you didn't use good data for this, I don't believe your index, but also the bank will say, you know, these, you're, you're relatively inefficient right now according to this index, how can we help give you development loans that will help you become more efficient? So all of that work that relies on that personal interaction and trust will be done by the people who already know one another. So in that case, we're very much kind of behind the scenes kind of just advisors and working out the methodology, but we won't. We might do some pilots in countries where we'll go and do a deep dive. We've been talking about that, um, but we won't be the main messenger because, yeah, like you said, that would be, I mean, can you imagine how that would go? Like, here you are, you're number 132 out of 150 countries. I've never met you before. And, uh, yeah, so that's a really good point. It's tricky because you want to scale, but you can't, you can't scale and lose that local relationship and trust part yet. So, what it's like? We're time for one more question. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, so, what, what would you? Um, What's your thought about a graduating students and their quantitative skills? Do they need more quantitative skills nowadays with this big data sets, measuring a lot of things, complicated um, formulas, complex analysis? What's your feeling about that? Yeah, so that's a good question. This kind of gets back to that look in the mirror thing that I was um, sort of mentioning at the beginning, it depends on what role you want to play in this kind of science. There's a lot of anthropology and social science and eliciting values that are, use methodologies that are not quantitative. So if that's what you really love, then you can do that and contribute greatly. But I would say that most of our um, core researchers and the projects that we do you absolutely need a couple of really quantitative people. So that skill gives you more options, I would say, in this kind of work, but it's not necessary. There's, and actually, I think we need to grow our collaborations with non-quantitative people, because um, to bring in those other sources of knowledge that, that we were talking about. So I'd say it would help you cr create, keep more options open if you're quantitative, but it's not necessary. Okay, now I'm going to suggest that people hug Mary informally and grab a beverage hey. or whatever and thank Mary again yeah, for a great talk.